all the uh, organic stuff that we put on beforehand. So we've hit play, Mr. DJ, which is DJ South Tech. It's not play. How you do? I keep thinking that we're getting a bigger audience, but do, can we see who's watching us on iTunes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we can follow. How many people we have? Like three people? Are we oh. on iTunes? Are we on iTunes? We are on iTunes. Come on, get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the memo. He's the governor. He I didn't only, get the memo. as with every other politician in America, he only needs, he's on a need to know basis. Yeah, <laughs> above my pay grade. <laughs> Needs, Way above. Needs an assistant. We're a play here. It's uh, Archway. I like the date. What's the date? August 24th. the 24th, 2016. Uh, we didn't do a podcast last week, so if you're out there following the two of you. We were jet setting. <laughs> we were out. jet setting. We were everywhere. Andy Sweet, Carlos Hampton, the governor. Governor. M- Michelle Peterson here, <laughs> always talking in the mics about relevant issues I of can't the day. We'll, we'll know when we've, when we've made it when someone's walking the streets and sees Carlos and goes, hey, governor. <laughs> you, you know what's like, funny, though? Whenever Amari introduced me, I was listening to uh, it, yeah. and he introduced me as the, the governor. governor, and I was like... I hope he knows that I'm not. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love it. The governor of Glass Street, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah maybe we should add that part on there, the governor of Glass Street, because the governor kind of opens it up for all kind of Falsehoods. Like, Carlos, you're in politics now? <laughs> yeah. This is amazing. You went right from nothing to the governor? Now that's a story. <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody been doing? Been doing well. Yeah, you know? Been doing well. I missed you guys. I missed you, buddy. Tired. Kids have started school. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Kids have started school. But you're, you were a 4 a.m. guy anyways. About when that I'm going to bed, time. you're getting up, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you even go to bed? I barely go to bed, but I sleep on the weekends. This past Sunday, I slept most of the day. I got up and ate, and then I went back to sleep, and then I got back up and ate again, and then I went back to sleep. So I would say on Saturdays, I probably sleep till about noon, and on Sundays, I, I don't really ever get out of bed. Because I've gotten emails from you, like, in the middle of the night, and I'm like, what is she doing up? <laughs> Why is she even up? I, my brain, man, it, you know, the quiet... Uh, it's how I've been able to do it all these years because when you're in the game, then you can't strategize. And when you're out of the, it's why I tell people all the time, if you've got a family or you've got kids, there's just no way you're going to be able to be, uh, I mean, without having some partnership in place. I mean, these people that go at it alone, I don't know how they do that. And run a business too. I don't know how they yeah. do that. Well, and there's a lot to, uh, and there's some funny, I think funny uh, correlations with sleep and and business mindset and everything else. They found definitely that people who sleep with schedules like yours, you know, like don't sleep during the week, sleep a ton on this day, uh, tend to be like creative mindsets almost think, always. I've already thought of myself as a creative. Yeah, versus uh, then people who are very regimented in their sleep schedules, right, tend to be analytical, very task and detail like they don't they don't alter anything the one thing that i don't do and i want to really knock on wood so hold on i don't uh struggle with sleep so i'm not one of those people that if my brain is going i don't feed into it and maybe that's because i'm blessed to be able to do something between 2 a.m and 5 a.m and then if I go to bed at 6 a.m. and somebody's looking for me at 7 or 8 o'clock a.m., I've got a backup now, which is Alice. So people can reach out, and if she knows that I'm not in trouble, that if she's seen work happen between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., <laughs> not to bother me between 7 a.m. and like 11 a.m., unless it's very important. But most times, honestly, I just sleep when my body needs rest and my mind needs rest. Now... What I don't know how people do is force sleep with Ambien or other things. That would just be hell on earth to me. You know, erratic sleep has bad effects on your metabolism, right? Well, that's why I'm 300 plus. Oh, hey, we got hammering. We got progress. Will that be on our podcast? This hammering? (laughs) Under construction. Maybe we should tell Tim to take a break for like... 30 minutes. Has it been doing that the whole time? This is the first time since I've been here. <laughs> Hold on. Hey, Tim! <laughs> oh, sorry, buddy. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what he's doing.
too, and he'll come down. I'll I'll ask him. I'll text him. <laughs> that is too funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, audience, but we're hammering away over here at Glass Street. Building Time is it. money. Let me the text him. The upper level see. is under construction right now, trying to, to uh, get the building all finished up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. Had a uh, board meeting with uh, Glasshouse Collective yesterday and uh, gave them a tour of Archway. And uh, Teal was really taken by where the building was and, and, and where it's come to. And um, you get out. I haven't even toured. I haven't, I haven't been outside of this room yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, well even this, this area here, um, where it was and, and where it is now, you, you could just feel the sentimental emotions going mm -hmm. because they, they remember when this was there and that was over there and when the floor gave and they had to move. And yeah, her, her and Catherine and uh, I think. Um, the other lady, Amanda, I believe her name is, uh, they, they came and toured the building. It's pretty cool. They toured it today? Yesterday. Evening, oh, yesterday? After the uh, board meeting. We well, had. we have 26 more chairs that I just struck a deal on. Awesome sauce. Are these permanent chairs in here? Now? These are permanent chairs. For here? For here. I mean, they would probably be prettier at the urban lawn, but I think Glass Street needs the prettier things right now, the furnishing. So... Everybody wants to be on the urban lawn. We've done real well this year, uh, very pleased, and actually looking to raise our price for next year because we've kind of got the statistical data on when the people are coming. And obviously one of the things that we're trying to do here at Archway is illustrate how you can make more money with more information. That's the way, that's the way this started. This whole investment in education was to give people a better return if they had the information to apply it in the marketplace. And one of the things that's interesting about my decision for these chairs over here and these wrought iron, which I, I'm missing five of these. I need to wow. find the five that we I'm still missing. still got to go searching for them, Carlos. No, well, no, I had go. somebody. You guys... Uh, <laughs> sent a text saying yeah, that we didn't have to go. Yeah, you didn't have to go. I, uh, I sent a text. Um, but once we candlelight these in here, I mean, this is going to be just one of the most gorgeous spaces I think I've ever designed. That is the creative in me. I enjoy pretty things. Once you candlelight it, can we hold seances in here? <laughs> <laughs> seances? No. Depends, poker. depends if you have a non Now, I will play poker in candlelight because then you got the whiskey, you got the poker. I mean, I, I think poker interestingly enough, should be legal. It's a game of skill, I think. But this guy in Virginia spent millions of dollars trying to establish a uh, precedent that, uh, that really beat out all the Vegas and the Atlantic City guys, and uh, he lost. Hmm. That poker is a game of skill. I think poker is very much a game of skill. Yeah, it's all perspective. It is all and, perspective. And who's selling it? So, yeah. Andy, uh, what you been up to, buddy? Sending kids to school, getting ready for some athletes doing some racing. Oh, yeah, you've got and, an Ironman uh, coming up. Yeah, and then traveling. You, well, you know, we're uh, working on a new website, so I went over, right. to, went over to the armpit of the country in <laughs> Columbia, South Carolina. Oh. I don't mean armpit being Man, mean. Man, that's terrible. If Columbia people, they definitely won't sponsor our 2022 show. It is the hottest place in this country <laughs> see they're hot right it's the hot new thing except it's just plain hot i have to admit i mean i've never been really attracted to south carolina at all except the lakes and the beaches i mean lake kiwi is one of the prettiest lakes i've sold a lot of home elevators around there uh in my day found it as like a little pond that none of the other competitors i did business with found and and the reason i found it is because uh, i got lost <laughs> one day and so i i literally got lost uh in the upstates of south carolina one time and i guess i didn't freak out and i just kept driving all of a sudden i ran in this big community called Gla cliffs at glassy mm -hmm. and i rolled up on this lady in my old uh Ford Escape, or I think I was in my Volkswagen Passat then, and I was like, hey, I'm here to see the Smiths, and they are like, oh, yeah, the Smiths, and I was like, yeah, I'm looking to put a, uh, I'm an interior designer, and they were like, oh, yeah, beep, and the door, the gate opened, and it was like, ooh, <laughs> and I went through there and sold like 16 home elevators, because <laughs> I knew there was somebody named Smith there. Always. That's like, you always think of some black person's named Jackson. 
you know, right? Smith. I think it's Smith. Smiths? I don't think there are many Smiths that are black, right? I think Jackson. Really? There must have been some a lot slave of Smiths. owner named Jackson. You know a lot of black Smiths? I know a lot of, and, and you know, I am I know black. Will Smith. So. <laughs> I know Will Smith. You have established that. Probably. Yeah, I, I know a lot of Smiths, Johnsons, Jones. Green. Green? Yeah. Green. Yeah. You gotta know. Wonder where they, uh, wonder what plantation owners, uh, it would be fascinating to see because there was a large South Carolina plantation owner. Uh, he had probably the most slaves uh, in the history of slaves in the United States. And I cannot remember his name, but they say there are over a million people named after him, and I can't remember did, his name. did some homework um, on my own last name, and, and South Carolina was one of the, uh, like you said, larger plantation owners, and uh, Hamptons come from, uh, was some of them come from South Carolina and plantations and oh, migrated yeah, to a, Alabama and uh, on, on up. You know, the way we should do this is we should just not start naming all these athletes in college after the brands they're wearing. So Jamal Nike. Jamal Nike. <laughs> <laughs> That's a plantation owner. <laughs> like. That is a plantation owner. Theodore <laughs> Nike. Yeah. Modern day, yeah. Like modern day plantation, like if your first name is, uh, um, I don't know, pick another name. Uh, I mean, there's some white dudes on there too. Richard, Richard Nike. Well, I think that that with the uh, with the whole plantation thing, the color is green, and whoever has the most green, that's that's the plantation owner. If you don't have it, regardless of what color you are, or where you're from, you just. But your old thinking has always been the same way that some people say to me, buddy, the people that make all the rules are the people with all the gold. That's true. I don't believe into that concept. I, I think so. I, I, and, and, and that's my own personal thought. Like we said, it's all perception. It's right. But I think the reality is I can disagree with you respectfully. Yeah. At, but if they began to name the kids after the brand that they're branding them with. Well, they basically are because if you – Look at uh, LeBron mm -hmm. James. You recognize his sponsorships. You know, you, you recognize him as a great athlete, but you also recognize Nike. Well, and I think here'd be another way of thinking about that. I if call you Jeff took a Gordon, guy, Jeff Pepsi. If you took a guy DuPont. like Le LeBron and you put him in unmarked normal street clothes, out of the norm from what you would see him in, and showed that picture to a bunch of people, how many could recognize him? And then you put him in a branded apparel and see how many people recognize and yeah. i think you'd see vastly more when he's wearing the brand i just think what would be fascinating is take the top 50 brands in this country that dedicate themselves to building density in order to sell things to people which is what we've been illustrating here at this table at archway with the nine to ten kids i'd love to talk a little bit about that but if you take the brand that someone else picked for them, the difference between LeBron James, in my opinion, is LeBron was able to negotiate his own value. When you tell kids that they can't go somewhere or enter an establishment or a business or become part of something that's higher than them with an economic ladder, and then you go privately negotiate that brand, then you should change their last name. I fundamentally believe that once they make that deal... They are no longer Tennessee Volunteers. They are no longer Auburn Tigers or War Eagle. They're no longer Crimson Tide. They become Andre Nike, Jamal Nike, Louise Nike, and you would begin to see the relevancy on their backs that they're treating these kids in these corporate cults, as I like to call them, because that's what Nike is. It's a corporate cult. People within that corporation believe they are doing the betterment for people by treating them like economic property to be privately paid. And that's why nobody's talking about it. It's why nobody uh, ever said anything to Jim Jones when he said, drink this Kool-Aid. Hmm. Because they trusted that Jim Jones had their betterment uh, and their, their, uh, their be what they wanted for themselves wasn't good enough. And he could sit there and pr prostatize all the things that he believed, and then the moment he tells them, now drink this Kool-Aid, uh, and, I mean, it was like, how many people drank that Kool-Aid? I referenced that 
uh, University of Tennessee plays next Thursday. And that's all I will sit there and think is what corporate cults and, and these organizations have become. And when they started, they were put in place not to exploit people, to give them, because that's what Harvard and Yale and all those universities were doing because they wanted bragging rights. They wanted to say we're better than you. And they didn't want to do the work themselves. They wanted a field hand to do the work. There's no difference. Hmm. And these are corporate cults. And, I mean, the two people listening to it, maybe it'll turn into four, maybe it'll turn into eight. But I'm going to talk about it till I die, until somebody shoots me or I die. Because they're corporate cults. So and if somebody shoots you and you live, you're going to not talk about it anymore. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I'm done. Until somebody shoots me or I die. Okay. So she got a flesh wound. It's, okay, that's it's enough only about a flesh that. Wound, according to what my, my mom said. That's, funny, man. that's enough of that subject. Let's talk about something else. Yeah. <laughs> it's a flesh wound. Well, it's, a, it's a moral standard that we've been trying to illustrate here at this table, right? Is that you have these kids, and Andy hasn't been. So I'd like your take on it, Carlos. Can you tell the story of the moral basis behind saying your name and your age and where you're from and what I've been doing? to illustrate how simple it is to enter a marketplace if you know and have the wherewithal to capture the information? Well, um, I'm trying to figure out how to grab this apple. Um, it's interesting because it's, it's something so simple that a lot of people don't consider or don't even realize is happening around them when you introduce yourself and you're like, hi, my name is such and such, from blah, blah, blah. You usually don't tell your age, but I've extended that to age. Yeah, but... But, but you can tell a lot about somebody by their age. But you're getting to know that person, and a lot of folks do it and don't even realize it. But it's one of those things that a lot of people, because... And I guess that's what I like about the South, is that we're so friendly, or we were so friendly, that when you introduced yourself, you knew who they were, where they were from, um, what kind of things they were into or whatever. And you didn't have to work for it, you know. Now, um, people don't speak as much. And people aren't as friendly, so you don't get that right. You have to dig and pull and dig and pull. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting because in the marketplace, that's how you get, like you said, the um, information about somebody in order to be able to sell something to them. You relate to them like the guy, uh, what, the bus driver's name? Yeah, Doug Short. Doug Short. He, he, he put it, pretty much put it on the table that when you introduce yourself, you do a lot more listening than talking. You, Especially if you're trying to sell the person yeah, in front of you something. You, you bring them on in and, and, and you ask them about the kids, about the wife, about the job, about their day, and so on and so forth. And you record those things down and then you come back and that's the first thing you hit them with. Hey, I remember your wife sells Tupperware or your kids are playing soccer or you're drive a Volkswagen or whatever. Uh, you said you were looking for the Smiths trying to get into this gate and you were driving a, uh, was it Jetta, Passat? Yeah, I think I was driving a Volkswagen Passat. Yeah. I, I was friendly enough to get past the economic class. But those things you remember to get them to trust you more. And a lot of folks, that relationship goes on back and forth a lot and people don't even realize it. And some, like I said, do it and don't realize that they're doing it. And, and it's a gift that a lot of folks don't have. But the ones that have it and explored it are the ones that tend to go further. But I think the ones that have it got it early in life. And so if we can teach these kids, these archway kids, as they begin to stay or go, because eventually they're going to become frustrated. I'm going to talk about something right now that I'm going to do tonight. And I'm going to give you the heads up on it. And I've told this to two people, and they think that I'm crazy for doing it. Mm -mm. Here we go. <laughs> and nobody knows that I've done this. Down so the, the rabbit hole. This we takes, the rabbit yeah, hole. we're going down the rabbit hole. Michelle Peterson. Uh, I think this story, everybody likes to me to be like the New York Times. To how long does this story take? I think it's going to take eight minutes if you're out there listening. <laughs> Maybe nine. Nine. Fluff. Bear with me. So in trying to teach morality through Marketplace over here at Archway, because I think morality can be exuded during Marketplace, which is why I say these corporate cults are no longer corporations. They're cults. Of personality they put stars in front of these kids and tell them they have a Chinaman's chance of becoming that guy and they can never get that carrot so one of the ways that I wanted to illustrate this over here was to the first night that we sat down and I did the exercise where I began the exercise exercise by eating with the children 
and eating with you guys, the adults in the room. So we had 10 kids and we had five adults. And then uh, I established that we laugh with people, not at people here. And I did that for a very uh, important message because people don't do business with other people who laugh at you. You can turn the channel and laugh in secret, but you definitely will not laugh at a guy with $100 million who falls in front of you or acts a fool as proven by Donald Trump. That guy is the epitome and the epitome of what's wrong with our marketplace because he can act absolutely crazy and because people buy into the way he is discussing and saying it with such conviction and they buy that he's a millionaire and a billionaire, which he probably is in some capacity in his own mind. But the reality is when these kids are sitting here, I'm trying to establish the number one thing in a thriving marketplace is consideration and kindness and remembering who you're in front of. And so what happened when we established that we laugh with people, not at people, is then I could begin to ask people to stand up and say their name, since Andy wasn't here, you were here, Carlos, and say their name, their full name, their age, and where they're from. And what you saw is during the beginning of that exercise the first night, the first Arch, Archway Wednesday that we did two weeks ago, is nobody hardly paid any attention. And the fact that the kids were so busy trying not to laugh at the other kids who were very uncomfortable standing up and doing that because they took me at my word. One of the kids pushed me probably as close as that she could to me asking her to leave by the fact that I established that I'll ask you to leave my table if you laugh at someone and not with them. But you saw what began to happen as they stood up the first time, and then I said, now, who can tell me the first name, the age, and the city for $50? Of every kid at the table. Of every kid and adult in the room. Person, yeah. And no one could do that. So then I said, without giving them any rules whatsoever, the next part of this is, could you do it if you know there's money on the line? And they were like, oh, yeah, we could totally do it. We could totally do it. And I was like, so you it mean to tell me if we repeat this exercise with the knowledge that there's money on the line, you'll get to that money. And I said, do you want to go off to the side and strategize? And they did. A couple of the kids did. A couple of them stated. And so the first night we did that, no one won the prize because no one picked up a piece of paper. No one asked someone for a pen. More importantly, no one used the phone in front of them other than RJ, who didn't do it appro and appropriately still <laughs> and still messed up because he didn't have the confidence to ask someone to repeat their name. And some of the kids were so not confident in the public realm yeah. of standing up that you had to have the fortitude amongst yourself to say, I'm sorry, Carlos, could you repeat your age? Some of the older people w whispered their age. And so they didn't have the ability to take control of the situation and ask someone because they were so worried by spotlighting themselves that they would be taken as ignorant or they would be taken as, I'm going to laugh at you, even though I'd established the rule that if you laugh at someone, you got to leave. So then we end the night where I say to them, you had no rules to this game. You could have asked an adult for their name. You could have asked for a pen. You could ask for a piece of paper. So the second night, which was last Wednesday, which I think was even a more fascinating study of human behavior and dynamic, we get to the same situation where now they know the game and the exercise, as I like to call it, because it's not really a game. It's an exercise in hubris, in pride. That's what it is. Are these kids so prideful, as Jane Austen said, is pride a fault or a virtue? And so lacking of consideration within their own world, that will they not stop and ask someone? So I say to them, okay, everybody, you ready? And they're like, oh, I got this. I got this. You're going to throw this $50 out there. But not one kid hardly brought a piece of paper, not one kid. And before the exercise began, because I knew they would rely on their technology, I told them that we, the one rule that I forgot to tell them last week that I like is for them to give their cell phones aside. None of them argued, and they all took their cell phones to Carlos. Remember that? All but one. Which was the one? I don't remember the one. Sugi kept her. Well, she had two. Oh, she did. That's yeah, right. But I told her she couldn't them. use it at my table. Yeah. And so then the, most of them didn't have a pen or a paper, but a couple of them recognized that now I don't have anything to remember these names. So a couple of them went and got their pens from some of the adults and a piece of paper. So what happened was 
they basically, when they went and got their phones, I took the pen and paper. No, no, no. I didn't do that at first. They just didn't write it down for 50 bucks. They just didn't get it yeah. the first time because they, they thought the there was going to be a round th- yeah. two. And they yeah. had their pen and paper, but they just didn't pay any attention. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. they didn't ask people to repeat themselves or spell their names. So we went through the first round of exercise. And then I said to them, okay, um, now who thinks they can do it if I put $500 on the table? And the crowd went, I mean, it was pretty spectacular. Well, you you have, <laughs> you have to realize what five hundred dollars is to some, some of these kids. Yeah, you know. So they the, go yeah. literally. I mean, the word batshit crazy. They go. They're hopping up. They're like, "Oh man, I got this!" Put and the they're money like, on the table. "Put the money on the put table." The, and then Shug goes, <laughs> "How do we know you have the money?" And this is tonight's exercise. I go over and I pull out what seems like $500. And I put a little wrapper that I had gotten from another deal around a $50 bill and 10 $5 bills. <laughs> Shenanigans. It's getting real. But I knew that at the end of the game, I would have struck the deal. It wouldn't have cost me $500 because what those kids didn't pay attention is they were acting crazy and acting like it was the most amount of money they were ever going to get in their life, I swiped the pens and paper. Carlos, I'll tell you. <laughs> it is, well, like, like I said, 500 bucks is a lot to some of these kids because they're struggling to get five or 10 bucks. But it does go, it, you know? it is an interesting place in behavior where, you know, you mentioned hubris because it's the thing. If you put a dollar out there, no one really, really would have cared. And yet, 500 like somewhere between there and 500 creates batshit crazy excitement yes. and nothing While i'm stealing the pins on the table that they don't even know i've got till we get right to the exercise and they look around i'm like y'all think you can do it and they're like buddy where's my paper where's my paper where's my pen yeah and i was like oh i got the pins while you were up celebrating about the opportunity to win 500 dollars, i took your pens and they were like, we'll get it anyways. And I was like, you can't use your cell phones. You don't have your cell phones either. And they're like, we'll get it anyways. And you saw these people begin, these kids begin to work together to try to figure out how they were going to remember the names except for RJ. You could also tell your uh, natural leaders too. Right. Or, so, or your thinkers. So RJ says to me, can I buy a pen? And I said, you can for $450. <laughs> and he says, buddy, and call us over there, $450 for a pen. That's a highway <laughs> robbery. I said, but I got all the pens, baby. I can charge whatever I want for them. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, I'm not doing that. And I said, you mean to tell me you're going to stop at a chance to get $50 and not pay me $450? And he goes, Oh, you're right, you're right. I'll give you $450. But he still couldn't get it because he didn't ask people to repeat themselves and people went too fast for him. He couldn't write fast enough. So it was Christian and uh, Shamari, Shamari, the smile, Mm -hmm. the smile kid. They say to me, buddy, can we get a go? And I said, you've already had your two goes separately. This is an interesting study. You should have been here because I I was even, I mean, it's a lot to surprise me and my mind was working so quick trying to keep up with these kids that what happened is Shamari and Kristen's Christian stand up and they say buddy do we get another turn I said you can buy another turn Omari was, was with him as well when it was five hundred dollars but when right. it got down to having to spend four fifty for the ink pen somehow or another Omari kind of yeah, slid out sat, yeah he yeah. slid down he was just like I can't it was three and then it ended up being then, just the, so the Christian two Christian and Omari stand back up they had already told me no for $450 and they said buddy we will give you $450 for um a chance at saying the names again without the pen and paper we've got it together because what they had done is they'd gone on the side and they had said you remember the Beans. kids and i'll remember the adults and we group up but here was the fascinating thing rj still had a turn the kid that had bartered on the 450 dollars. so he looks at me and says 
I got another turn, buddy. I could get it this time because he and Suge had been over there conspiring. I don't know what they had done. And basically, I said, oh, you got another turn? I said, well, here's the way it works in my world. Majority rules. Who goes first? The majority gets to determine who gets to go first. And Shamari and Christian go, we're going first. <laughs> the uh, guy was working it alone. He couldn't work, get to the... They voted. It was, the vote was, was two vote to one. Yeah, yeah. Because they voted Isaac out early. That's right. See, what you don't know and what I missed <laughs> in the story is yeah. I gave them the opportunity to let a new kid in who had a pen and paper they didn't pay any attention that I had not taken, but I won on that one because they didn't observe that he had a pen and paper. Yeah. So I took a vote in between the $50 exercise and the $500 exercise. I took a vote whether – we didn't want to hurt Isaac's feelings, so we did like the federal government. We took a vote to have a vote. Nice. And none of the kids raised their hand. They didn't want Isaac in. They didn't want Isaac in. <laughs> and I said to the kids, would you please raise your hand so that Isaac doesn't get his feelings hurt, that the only reason you're not voting to take a vote on whether to allow Isaac in is because you know that the fewer people at this table, the better chance you have of winning $500. And all nine of them raised their hands. <laughs> and what I'm going to say to him, and what I'm going to say to him tonight <laughs> is none of them observed that Isaac had a pen and paper. Even Amari had a pen, had a pen and pencil over here. Right. And forgot that he had it. Right. And like right towards the end or whatever. It was like, you had a pencil all this time? And he kind of like goof walked over and grabbed it and goof walked back to the table. Right, but he had already <laughs> he used his it. chance. Yeah. And Shamari and uh, Christian had already um, bartered their deal, bartered 450 them. bucks. So they won 50 bucks. And they jetted to Sandy's to go bust it. They jetted <laughs> down to Sandy's to bust that $50 that they had won through conspiring together to remember. One remembered the kids' names, ages, and location, and the other remembered the adults. But here was the funny thing. If anyone would have taken it a step further, they would have seen they were only playing for $100. <laughs> so tonight... I think, depending on who shows up, which it may be that only two people show up, but the reaction that's going to be fascinating is to see if anyone still picks up the money and counts it, takes it out of the uh, $50 thing. Before they win it? Before they win it. I don't think they have the, the, the concept that they that they would be they allowed even, to even yeah. do that. Yeah, I think they're going to tr send the money on the table. They're going to trust that you put whatever you say is on the table there, and they don't think that they can sit and verify that it is what it is before it's they even. Sitting right in front of me, kind of the way the big boys own the money yeah. and the marketplace now, and they are sharing it within their cults. But the cults staying quiet about it yeah. and not telling anybody because they're feeding from that trough. And so what I can most rely on is that I'm going to negotiate my way down to $100 tonight because I make the rules. That's the – everybody who has the gold makes the rules, right? That's my yep. And so I'm sitting <laughs> at this table tonight, and what I'd like to do, uh, Devin, is I would like to keep the microphones where we could show uh, – are you going to be here tonight, Governor? For sure. Where we could Definitely. show the Governor how to turn it on. Where the uh, We can record me telling kids – what's going on, and begin to watch me negotiate down, and I never even had to bring 500 to the table anyways. Yeah, yeah, I never even. I can bring, I could bring, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put a 50 and 21s behind that, and no one will check it. I don't think they know that they can check it, though. But that's the reason why we have a free press in this country and why it's so important. Because when you start looking behind the curtain of the Wizard of Oz and you realize it's some little dude exploiting fear, cowardly, ego, that's why the Wizard of Oz happened, right? Yep. Is because you can look behind there and see that this dude doesn't have anything. He's mortgaged everything to try to exploit their inability to look at the money. Yeah, but I, I, think, I think what you're dealing with is something similar. And going back to the show we were watching earlier, is the... Um, the concept of people thinking that the world is squared off and falls off at the horizon versus someone saying, no, there's something else on the other side. You know, the way that they were raised, there's, there's boundaries, there's lines, and some, some things you do, some things you don't do. And I think that that's the reason that's going to hold them back from not wanting to verify that the money is what it is. Now, if some guy came in here with ragged clothes and no haircut, no shave, and said he had 500 bucks, they're going to discount him. But because they know that you 
drive on this a building, nice truck. drive a nice truck, you say from Lookout Mountain or whatever, they're going to take you at your word. So, so that, that, that's going to be the difference in why they are not going to verify that that money is that's what you say it is. That's exploitable impression or perspective, right? Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, that's what you, you always heard before, people that were trying to make a move and uh, we were, Michelle and I were talking pharmaceutical reps the other day yeah. in that world. Like why back in the day when that farm industry was growing so much, those people would do everything to lease the nicest car they could to go everywhere so that people saw these guys rolling up in nice cars. Like, I'm not sure how many guys there were in the pharma yeah, industry, true. to be honest that's with true. you. Yeah. Most of my really pretty girlfriends did that. And I never faulted them for that. Honestly, I thought you go girl. You go sell for Merck or Glaxo or that pharma looked worked for them. They got the stock in it probably now may have some stock that's benefited their family. I'm not, I walk, I say this a hundred times. I try to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. I'm not going to uh, judge Mary Mag- Magdalene and I'm really not judging Phil Knight up at Nike. I'm just saying it takes a government to break up cults. And our government is not functioning properly for our marketplace to give people economic ladders because people are satisfied with what is occurring when you turn on a Saturday afternoon and watch guys, mainly of color, beat the shit out of one another for the economic advantage of an education and they're not even holding the schools accountable for not giving them that. You know, speaking of they Nike should be penalized economically by our government. Yeah. They should. They should be penalized just as if I'm speeding down the road and I'm endangering lives. They should, they should penalize those universities by not educating those people for making that public barter and then privately going out and making millions of dollars off the skin, the equity of people who don't know any better. Because I know better, and I still watch those games. Which is scary too, because it, it it where I was talking with even on the lower scale, non university level, but high schools and whatnot, where you know a a certain football team might be popular and bring in a ton of money via whatever their clubs and attendance at the games and all that, and we would like to believe that all this money comes into the school and does good for the school. Well, it doesn't. It just cycles back through only in the foot, right? Like, and, and this yeah, was and a this was a school. case where the women's soccer team at the high school wanted to practice on the football field on Thursdays, and the football department basically said, "No way. We need that pristine for Fridays." Like, why should they not get access to the school's field on this day? And it's like, well, we, you know, the, the response well, basically was, don't make any we, money. yeah, we pay, Nobody cares about we pay for sports. this, right? We pay for this via that. And it's like, that's the same thing in university, right? These, these uh, sports teams and whatever else are bringing in millions and billions of dollars, not to make it easier for kids to get an education at that university, only for their, that individual sport. Yeah, because again, and Carlos, uh, uh, you know, in his mindset, I do agree with him. It's green, but if you named everybody after the plantation that they're labeled, so that when you go, to, a kid goes to class and he what raises his hand or she raises her hand, because in some instances, I mean, Pat Summit, I mean, God rest her soul, honestly proved, given enough access to marketing dollars, means that you can go out. And you can solicit and pair off people who didn't know they would want to pay $30 to watch a women's basketball game because it's exciting when it's led properly. But it comes from the top down. And our leadership in this country um, is trying to have their cake and eat it too because most businesses that are acting as these corporate cults are not making money on the products and the economic slaves that they create either on the college uh, PR field or over in India, China, Taiwan, whoever is sewing those machines together. What they're making money on is the volume of people within their cult that are buying insurance. And then they're going to Vermont and placing all of that insurance money within a captive. The state of Vermont allows them to do because it increases their tourism in a small state like that. It's the same reason Switzerland became the home 
for everything that was wrong with Europe when the, uh, uh, you know, the people, the kings and queens began to make money through the landowners is they could park that money and protect it. And so the reality is, is that when these companies are acting as insurance collectors and making money on the float, even Warren Buffett said he, he wouldn't have ever made the kind of money that he has made, even though he has made really good decisions, buying Dairy Queen, buying Shaw Industries, buying Wells Fargo. He did that on the backs of people's fear for their families, and they would pay insurance premiums, but they wouldn't pay taxes. That's why I call insurance private taxation. It's just like those kids, you know, they're trying to get a leg up and we're trying to mitigate the risk of someone getting in a car accident and they can't find health care to survive. So we pay, we're trying to mitigate our risk for somebody burning our building down who is trying to fleece us. Those, it's no wonder it came out of New York. Because if they didn't pay the guy in the 20s or the 10s, 1910, when some guy came next door and said he was going to protect your business, then when they didn't pay him, then they had to... burn down the building. Right. Then they <laughs> had to worry about that dude who was protecting them, actually harming them, and then they would buy into it. It was the reason why. It's why The Godfather was made, those movies. Because it illustrated that if you didn't pay me, I'm going to mess up you. I'm going to mess you up. It's institutional bullying through people's fear and the love of their family. And where you really break the tide is when people just pay into that institutionally and they don't go to the person that's moving that money around. They just assume that money's going to be there. And as been proven in 2008, the federal government will pay if the insurance industry gets... Because it's an arm of the insurance industry. States regulate insurance companies, we've already established, make $10.8 billion dollars off of insurance fees and other things. It's just one big loop. And they're trying to catch as many people as they can to buy into it because then that allows, when a young person is less likely to need insurance, I lived without insurance for 20 years. People thought I was crazy. I was like, have you seen the statistics on the likelihood that something's going to happen to me? And my mother was like, you have to have benefits, Michelle. Please have benefits. And it's because her love wanted to protect me. But I was just enough risk taker to be like, I can negotiate my way out of a car accident because the bankruptcy laws are so prevalent in this country and I don't have anything except my own skin. So if it gets scuffed up on a motorcycle accident, I can go in that hospital, they'll give me the care, maybe not the level of care that somebody rich is going to get, but hopefully somebody there patches me up and then when I get that $2 million bill, I can be like, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I got nothing. And you know that, that's interesting because um, answering in on a lot of these these um, emergency medical calls, um, the paramedics show up who are covered under the county or, or sponsored under the county, and um, one jumps off and they're assisting the patient. The other one's collecting information, and they ask for ID and insurance cards right off the bat. Yeah, they want to know. You know, but they don't leave if the guy doesn't have ID or insurance card or the girl. I've never seen them leave, but as as strong as they push for it, it's, it's amazing because we pull up and the focus is help the person. They pull up and the focus is I need that ID and insurance card. And the person gets hauled off or whatever, but um, there's, there's, a lot, lot of, there's, there's a lot of importance placed on collecting that identification card. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Well, and there's an oath that doctors have to uh, take. And, Andy, you'll help me out with this because I'm going to slaughter this name. Um, the What is it? The Hippocratic Oath? Mm -hmm. So have you ever heard your name uh, is Mud? You ever heard somebody say that? Your name is Mud. You ever heard that? Nope. A anybody that's saying? Yeah, so Dr. Samuel Mudd is who set the uh, John Wilkes Booth's leg after he killed Lincoln. And it established, you set the leg. You don't <laughs> judge the person in front of you, but it became this metaphor for you're a terrible person by saying it was Samuel Mudd was the, how that saying came about. Mm -hmm. Everybody probably thought it had something to do with Mudd, M-U-D, and it was actually M-U-D-D. Mm -hmm. Because what the story behind it is is that Dr. Samuel Mudd may have been someone who 
thought the president need to be out of presidency or maybe was a, you know, whatever they call that when people agree with a philosophical point of view, a sympathizer. But when John Wilkes Booth jumped uh, off of the stage after he shot Lincoln, he broke his leg. And they say that when he got about halfway out that th of the theater, some sympathizers of him took him over to Samuel Mudd's office and, and the doctor set the leg. And I don't think he even knew what happened. Uh, if, According if, if, if to folklore right. and the stories that my grandmother told me and the stories that I've heard over a period of time, it had to do with the fact that he set the leg because that was the right thing to do. Not judge the guy for just having killed the president because that's what America is all about. Not judging someone. Yeah. I, I, it, and I may have heard it wrong. You know, you, you hear different stories or whatever. But I thought that uh, whenever, I, whenever I heard it, he set the leg not knowing what he had just done. John Wilkes Booth had just done. Oh, yeah. And... Um, by the time it was all said and done, and it all came out, and I said, "Well, you helped him. Yeah, you you yeah. know, you, you're you a horrible what, person." Paul, you're right. Now that that story does resonate with me. That yeah. someone told me that that he didn't know, but still, yet how he awesome did. is that? You know, that he set the it. leg. Yeah. He, he he did do it and, and didn't worry about I guess charging the guy, but he didn't realize that this guy had just killed the president. Hmm. So I'm going to bring up something that will lead into our next podcast about that's fascinating about setting the leg and your name is Mud. So everybody uh, is talking about all this fascinating technology when it comes to self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. I'm scared of that. But what if the data that people collect on you begins to go into a mainframe system that you have to make a choice or the computer has to make a choice of who they hit or who they don't hit if something malfunctions. And with an instant, uh, you will know if that person is 20% better than the other person. Have they done better deeds for humanity? What if the computers begin to decide who they kill and they don't kill based on how good or how bad we are? <laughs> what, what, what that even goes back to the, uh, and we talked about this a little bit before, the uh, black market for organs. Yeah, yeah I can't, I'll be honest with you, uh, Carlos, I watched that whole video twice. <laughs> and I have to tell you, there is a certain n number of things that I don't do. I don't watch horror films because I think life is horrible enough. I think the, the real, actual, I think war and all the things that happen... Uh, so I don't need to be scared to have some perspective on things. There was a movie this summer that if I had been in uh, some form of government, I would have been touting had some sort of tax on it because it was called uh, um, the day where people go out and kill one another. They get 24 hours to kill. Purge. Yeah, it was Purge 2. Mm -hmm. I was sitting at an English drama movie at the Carmike, and they ran that as a trailer. Okay. And I was like, I'm in a freaking English drama. Where do these people see? I was, I was literally like nauseous after they ran that trailer. Well, and and I just wanted thing. to watch Jane Austen for Christ's sake. But the, 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 there probably is a reason behind it, and it's, it's emotion, right? They, they knew in that movie running that trailer was going to garner emotion. <laughs> It garnered throw up with yeah, me. That's fine. It's the same same thing, you know, with all these new Facebook emotions, right? The, you saying that something makes you angry or makes you sad is just another algorithm to pick up on what you like or don't like. And and to be honest, the sad ones and all that stuff probably not a big deal. But what you say you love and what you say makes you angry gives action. You know, to, to all yeah. the marketing out there, I I, I, it. Uh, I mean, I, I what a you, what a totally fascinating thing! And so, I mean, there's I a really reason that they want they wanted special. you to have that emotion in that movie. Yeah. Um, I'm telling you, if for for you guys and everyone, the, one of the most <laughs> frightening and interesting reads I've had in a while was uh, a book called The Circle by Dave Eggers, um, and it's exactly right on par with what we're talking about and pertinent in this in this conversation of collection of data and how you can be right on par it's basically you could you could think of this company the circle as as google or whoever else right 
starts getting bigger and bigger and collecting more and more data. And the whole time you, you're seeing, they're trying, they're telling you they're using it for all these good purposes. And you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's Google. pretty cool. Like, oh, Don't here we go. Evil. Here we go. Like, th yeah, that's really smart. We should, we should completely have monitoring in this world. And oh yeah, we should do that. That, that makes good sense. And how cool technologically advanced we are. And then somewhere midway through the book, near in the end, you start going, nope, nope. <laughs> I don't, I don't agree anymore, but you can't because you're already down the rabbit hole of saying you agreed with everything up to that point is the most beautifully well, written you, right? philosophical book yeah. about marketing. It's all marketing. Uh, it's fascinating and frightening because you can see in there how far along we already are <laughs> down the, the Well, the, and that's what I'm saying. When you look at the engineering that could come, it sounds like a fantastic thing that people – are not going to be driving anymore because I've been on the road for 30 years making a living. I'm 46 years old and I delivered newspapers at the age of 16 in another neighborhood in Johnson City at five o'clock in the morning. So I passed drunks. I mean, there was not a split second between me and death while participating in my life trying to make some money because I didn't want to be poor anymore. So it makes sense. I, I more than importantly didn't want my mother to be homeless based on the fact that I could see the financial strain happening within my parents' partnership. It didn't have anything to do with sex and then procreate. It had to do with they were young. They decided to do something together, and one was Appalachian and one was a hillbilly. I always say if I wrote a story about my parents, it would be called When a Hillbilly Marries an Appalachian Person. <laughs> because my mother could bring the thought process into the process and go down the rabbit hole, and my dad could just go out and facilitate the strategy. And to my dad's credit, it took him a long time to figure out independent truck driving, but deregulation really, as, just as Google has made me a millionaire, and it has. I mean, that's the sad part about that book, is I figured out five years ago, I could look at the data, and I could make certain decisions, and I could go in certain people's pond, and I could do the research that these kids won't even get to until they're 50, if they even get it there. I just had a head start because I delivered newspapers. I knew that the people who own the news can massage it any way they want and they can blame the newspaper boy for it being wet. Even if it wasn't my fault, because I would always say to that lady who called, that person's paper got delivered at 6 a.m. and they're calling you at 8 p.m. It didn't rain between 6 and 7 p.m., 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. It rained at 7.30 p.m., and you're not paying me anymore to wrap your papers in plastic. But the only reason I knew that is because I'd go home and tell my mother, more importantly, my grandmother, the one that said the F word all the time, I'd tell her, they want me to wrap those newspapers. And she would take a drag off her cigarette and be like, are they paying you more to wrap the newspapers? And I was like, well, they're not. And she'd be like, well, that's a problem, don't you think? <laughs> 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 and I'd be like, well, but it wasn't raining this morning. And she'd be like, you might want to tell that guy he needs to get his paper sooner. And then you go tell the guy, and he's like, what do you mean get my paper sooner? And I mean, it was just like this. <laughs> you'd pick not to have the argument. You just wrapped it in plastic for free. Because the guy was, the client was so awful. I, and the newspaper wasn't going to pay anymore because they were the richest family in Johnson City, hmm. besides the coal miners. Hey, I want to tell you something I want to do uh, if there's a rapper out there listening. You know, dude, I have found this rapper who's in town. I mean, her name is Caramel Kitty. Have you heard of this person? I have not. <laughs> I mean, the name itself may institute that I probably should not have anything to do with her, but she is a fantastic rapper. Hmm. And I have sent her video. In fact, hey, uh, oh, well, we're trying not to cuss here, aren't we? She cusses no. all the time through her rapping. We're already in. I don't think yeah, we've, don't. any of us have said the F word, and her, her rap is I every other have. F word. Huh. Her name is Caramel Kitty, and she sings about Benji and Thule. And she's over on the west side. And who's Benji and Thule? Well, it's interesting because Benji might be the money, but she uses it in a figurative sense as though Benji is her boyfriend. Benji going to take care of me. She, and then she uses in her video Thule as her gun. 
but then there's a guy named Tuli. So I can't make out if she actually likes Benji because he has the money and Tuli keeps the money safe. But at the end of her video, she basically has a police officer. Have you seen this video, DJ? She has a police officer come to her door. The music stops. Knock, knock, knock. This is a, somebody pretending to be a Chattanooga police officer. Mm -hmm. And she pays him off. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Tupac, he uh, had a song, Me and My Girlfriend, which Jay-Z and Beyonce redid um, in 2003, I believe. And uh, the song Tupac did, Me and My Girlfriend, he was referring to a gun. All I need in this life of sin is me and my girlfriend. And when he would go down his verses or whatever, he would, would be referring to a gun, but he would make suggestions like it was a woman. So that's not uncommon, the Benji being the money and Thule being So the here's gun. my theory behind this rapper, okay? My theory is she's down in Atlanta right now. I can follow. She's been on BET a few times in their contest. Awesome. Yeah, she seems like she's trying to work it, you know? Uh, she ha has done her filming at the projects next to the barn nursery where I go to get my plants and my topsoil and all the things that I get there. Right. Is that... Lake. East That's Lake. East, Lake. East Lake. So she's in East Lake rapping about, she's really, really good, y'all. I mean, I can spot talent from a mile away, and I can certainly smell bullshit from two miles away. And she's really good. So I want to re-record Tennessee, Ernie, Ernie uh, Tennessee Ford's I Owe My Soul to the Company Store with a rapper. So I know a family in Johnson City to know, that knows that guy, Tennessee uh, Ernie Ford's family and I want to license that copyright and I want this girl to redo that song while playing all these college athletes <laughs> I want her to rap this song do you hear that DJ do we have a studio we can go to if we can pay her to come redo this song we're building a studio remember well we haven't gotten there yet but do, is there a local a studio we can buy studio time, time in? <laughs> Just a matter of egg crates. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wouldn't know that that's Maybe you could do a little research for us and let us know. And we could even go to Atlanta because all she has to do is take these, this, this song because it was very applicable at the railroad stages. And apply it to the NCAA, I owe my soul to the company store, and wrap it. But her name, you're going to look it up. Her name is Caramel Kitty, spelled with a K. I'm not sure Caramel's actually spelled properly either. But Benji, <laughs> and all I need is Benji and Tuli. I think is the name of the song. It is very graphic, y'all. So I'm just apologizing to anyone out there, the two people listening. But it is hilarious. Hmm. But also very, like, does she know something that we don't know? Because literally this guy pretending to be this cop pulls up on her and lets her go. And then, like, you're the rat has him knocking on the door later to get his payoff. Now, I definitely don't want to get shot if there are crooked Chattanooga police officers that think that I think the police are wonderful people. <laughs> At the same point... I just thought that her Benji and Thule song, I would like to know and maybe ask her, is Benji meaning Benjamin? Do you think that's what it is? I'll have to hear the lyrics, but I, that sounds about on point. And Thule, you think, is, yeah. Is, yeah. is the gun? I hadn't heard the song yet, but I'd be willing to say. All right, I think on, on that note, we have told a lot of stories. I'm not at all insinuating that any police are corrupt. <laughs> In any way, you because heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, you she heard it here first. It. Just, no. <laughs> <laughs> just telling you, it's a good thing nobody's listening to us. <laughs> Somebody's listening. Uh, you Somebody's think? Always listening. You think? You whatever you do, you you don't set the leg, or don't you set do the set the leg. No, you set the leg. You set the leg, but you don't you wrap have the to newspaper. set the leg. Yeah, you don't write the you don't wrap the are. newspaper for free. I don't yeah. know who they are. Still set the leg, but find out who they are. No, but you got to set the leg. That's right. It's the but, Hippocratic Oath. You set the still, leg. He still caught, caught the rap. He still caught the rap. Your name is Mud. It's still Mud. But that's and the it went way. Down generations, right? 
He, man, they didn't even charge back then. Doctors got chickens, man. Yeah, yeah they, they bartered. They the bartered service. back yeah. then. My friend Richard, he's always talking about his dad. They own this pristine piece of property on the Tennessee River right outside of Knoxville. And I keep telling his words about $8 million bucks, And he's not about the money. But his dad was a country doctor in Lenore City and over in Rockwood. Wow. And he would take chickens and goats and other things in exchange for setting the leg. Back when they made house calls. Back when they, and I think we're getting back to house calls, by the way. I'm looking at an app right now that allows you to have a doctor come to your house. It's all about our, convenience. Our vet is a traveling vet. Comes to it's your all house. About oh, your vet comes to the? Fabulous. Man, yeah. I got a great vet buddy in town, John David Mullins. Is he your vet? Mm -hmm. He's a fantastic man, but. We're going to end the show, but should we take a vote here? Because majority rules, there's four of us, so we could tie. Should we play Benji and Thule? I think we should get permission. Yeah. We need to get permission from Caramel Kitty? Yeah, I think we should do that. I wonder if Caramel I'm not opposed Kitty to doing has it, though. a manager. I'm, I'm not opposed to, to playing. I'm, I think it's I'm all about yeah, I, I don't exposure. think there's any reason to... Uh to uh, do we stay put, away from the curse. Is, do is we a do shows and adult shows? I, I don't really? know who's oh, listening can, to this. We can flag it. Have we on, been rated? We can flag it on. Oh, you know you've made it if you've everything. been rated, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just ask her if she has any radio versions. Power ninety four. Do, do they still do a street? Uh, <laughs> but the FCC won't. We can always flag it as explicit on iTunes and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we could, we could play it without our permission because we're not selling sponsorships to the show yet. Oh, we need our permission. You no, don't want to start. I don't want to start beef with Chattanooga Police. Certainly Chattanooga Fire Department because we don't know who likes the governor there or doesn't like the governor. We're not certain about that. <laughs> we don't want any issues at all. We don't want any issues <laughs> jeopardizing Carlos's pension. Lord help us. Lord help us. Lord help us. I have to move on Lookout Mountain. Oh, man. <laughs> I got hard. three houses up there, buddy. I'll, I'll be, give you one. I promise. I'll be like, uh, what was the, the, uh, the comedian that, that uh, moved in with, with the family? And they tried to get rid of him all the time. He ended up oh, falling yeah, in love yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. The light-skinned guy. What was his name? No, no, no. That was that Queen Latifah movie, House uh, Guest. No, what's his name? Was it Queen Latifah? House she Guest? moves in with uh, Steve Martin, and that's one of the funniest movies ever. What's his name did it, too? Um, what's the guy's name? The light-skinned guy. Uh, real popular in the 80s and early 90s. Daddy was a preacher. He had the big red, mm -hmm. um, funky-looking haircut. Big guy. What colors? Oh, wait, dude, I know that guy, Sinbad. Sinbad. Yeah, I saw him here. Uh, I waited like on him, actually. Well, look, let's get out of here today. Uh, Archway is tonight on Wednesday night. If you listen to this, Devin, can we get this by Friday, you think, by this Friday? Can we get it? Don't edit anything. Even edit, like, is this, are we live? I always like to hear our process. And then can we, rabbit hole. and then we're going to play Caramel Kitty with her permission with at her some permission. point. And then we're also going to leave the mics on tonight for uh, Carlos to hit uh, record. Right, Devin? That's the plan? Yeah. Okay. So, everybody, I guess, have a good Wednesday. and Happy Wednesday. We're Happy out. Happy Wednesday. Sounds good. Bye. Yep.